Hello booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Bouquets and Books. I have a tag for you today. I was tagged by Jack from Spread Book Joy and Shelley Swearingen and they are the original creators of this tag. It's the picture this tag. It goes with the readathon that they are hosting in April, which is to encourage us adults to read picture books. And the tag is based on picture books, but we don't have to answer with picture books. And I won't in my case. I will answer with uh, real adult books. <laughs> so, of course, I will leave links to both of their channels in the description box below. Very important. So, first prompt. Love You Forever by Robert Munch. Name a book you imagine you'll love forever. I have a few answers for that. Uh, Jack stole my answer. She said Anne of Green Gables. And I could answer Anne of Green Gables, but I could answer Anne of Green Gables for every prompt in this tag. Almost, not quite, but almost. So I will add another one. Um, I will add Pride and Prejudice. Um, it's great, it's wonderful, and um, I love this book. And then I will also add The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Um, it, it will come again later, uh, a couple of times, I guess. Um, but I read this book when I was 13 or 14 years old, I think 14, and I've loved this book ever since. Um, so I think I'm going to like it forever. Even though I have heard horrible things about this book, I uh, there's a scathing review by Hélène from, um, I forgot the name of her channel, but I will leave a link in the description box. Uh, it's full of spoilers, by the way, that review, but it's an absolute scathing review of the book. And I, I can only agree with her, she's absolutely right. But I love the book anyway, <laughs> so I can imagine I will love this book forever. Um, prompt number two, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, Very Bad, No Good Day by Judith Vjorst. Uh, which books or comforting things do you turn to when you are having a bad day? I turn to rereading books and I turn to rereading books in... Um, in sections, not cover to cover. I just go straight to the part of the books that I love. For example, the three books that I mentioned for question one. In The Three Musketeers, I would turn straight to the chapter where D'Artagnan managed to pick up a fight with Athos, Porthos, and Aramis all in the same day. It's one of the best chapters. So I would go straight to that one. Um, in Pride and Prejudice, I would go for the scene where uh, Lady Catherine the Bird decides to come to Longbourn to confront Elizabeth Bennet. Um, or I would go to the scenes with Caroline Bingley. I think she steals the show. I love Caroline Bingley. Well, I love to hate her. <laughs> so I often turn to the scenes with Caroline Bingley. Or in Anne of Green Gables, uh, every chapter is almost a short story, not quite, but uh, uh, in this case, uh, my favorite is, of course, the first day of school. Well, not the first day, but uh, uh, the first day of school where Anne is with Gilbert Blight and she ends up breaking her slate over Gilbert's head. Uh, it's my favorite scene of the book. So I turn to that one very often. Uh, question number three, The Very Hungry Cater Pillar by Eric Carl. Which book, series, characters spark your hunger for reading? And we are back to Anne of Green Gables. This very copy, uh, it's stained because um, I, I've had that copy. Well, in fact, at the origin, it was my mother's copy. Um, how I got into Anne of Green Gables, there was a cartoon on Saturday or Sunday morning that was quite true to the book. So when I saw it the first weekend, it, it aired, my mother said, oh, there's a book about that, you should read it. And she loaned me the book. And I read one chapter a week and I was following with the cartoon, which was quite faithful to the book. So I could follow. And um, from then on, I remained a reader. I remained a voracious reader. I read prior to that because obviously this is not a kid's book. If you look at the print, it, it's not made for kids. It's a book made for adults, including the cover. It's a book made for adults. But... Um, in a way, this crystallized the fact that I would become a reader. So for me, it's really the book that defined me as a reader. Before that, I read books. After that, I was a reader. I think that's the difference. Question number four. Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. What's the most unusual book you've ever read? Okay, for this one, it's not Anne of Green Gables. Uh, for this one, I'm going to answer two books by uh, Georges Perec. So this is Georges Perec. This is an omnibus collection. He wrote an entire book, an entire novel without using the vowel E a single time. 
That is weird. And it made sense. The book made sense. Even um, there was a reviewer at the time who reviewed the book as a normal mystery, who did not notice that the mystery, the thing that was missing, uh, was the letter E. He, the reviewer just didn't notice at all. So it was reviewed as a regular book and he gave it a pass. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so there's an entire book without the, the vowel E being used a single time. And then there's a sequel. And in that sequel, the only vowel used is the letter E. Uh, both of these books have been translated in English, but obviously I can only imagine that the translation is not very faithful. Um, it, it's a translation that respects the constraint of either never using the vowel E or using only the vowel E. Um, so I guess the story must be completely different. In English, the title is Avoid, the, that's the first one, and the second one is the Ex Exeter Text. Um, so yeah, they, these are two semi-weird books, but they read very well. Question number five, Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. What is your favorite book featuring the natural world? Nature. I assume that nature is anything that is not man-made. We, we tend to associate nature with trees and plants and birds and animals, but I, I will go farther than that. I will say that nature is the universe, is the cosmos. And my favorite would be this one. It's not translated in English, it exists only in French. It is Patience dans l'Azur by Hubert Reeves. And it's a book that explains the origin of the world and the cosmos and how it works and the soul, not just the solar system, but the entire cosmos, uh, galaxy, black holes, and the basic of cosmology. And when I read this, um, now I, at least 10 years ago, um, it was the first time that I sort of grasped how big the universe was. I was reading it and I was feeling this sort of vertigo at how huge the universe was and how little and insignificant I was. So it was a very eye-opening in my case. It's one of the first science books I read. I think, well, it's basically the first science book I read. Um, and I remember why I read it. I had read an article in a newspaper um, where uh, some scientists were deploring the fact that for a person to be considered cultured, to cultivate, cultured, cultivated? I don't know what's the word. Um, that for a person to have culture, the person needed to know history and geography and a whole bunch of things related to social science, but it was okay if the person knew nothing about science science, about uh, not even the most basic notions of physics or the most basic notions of chemistry, and that we nevertheless would consider the person as being uh, knowledgeable about the world. So I thought, I, I felt targeted by that because I considered myself to be somebody who has a basic general knowledge. Um, I know that the capital of pretty much every country in the world, and I have uh, some notions of literature, some notions of history, of geography, and all of that. But I knew almost nothing about science, so I decided to read a few books about it. And I cannot say that it sticks very well in my mind. I tend to forget it as soon as I read it, but at least I read it. And while I read it, I understand it and I love it. So th this is one of the books that I really like about our world, the natural world, because, yeah, the stars are completely natural. <laughs> uh, question number number six. Good Night Moon. Aha, there's a link. Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise. Do you read... Margaret Wise Brown and illustrated by, there's no name for the illustrations. So, uh, do you read at bedtime? Do you read to someone else at bedtime? Did anyone ever read to you at bedtime? Um, it depends what you consider bedtime. I tend to read from the moment I finish supper to the moment I go to bed. So I don't necessarily in my, read in my bed, I read there. But I guess the three or four hours before bedtime are bedtime, so... Yeah, <laughs> um, I don't read to anyone. I read to myself in my head, not aloud. And did anyone ever read to you at bedtime? Oh yes, it was not quite bedtime, it was bath time. Uh, while my mother was watching, uh, was watching, no, while my mother was washing the dishes and uh, let's say she was giving a bath to my brother, uh, my father would read stories. And while I was in the bath, he would read stories to my brother. So we read countless and countless stories, just sitting on a rocking chair. Uh, my father was in the middle. My brother was sitting on one arm of the rocking chair. I was sitting on the other arm and he was reading book after book after book. 
book. And most of the books were uh, a collection from Disney. They were hardboard, uh, hardcover books, cardboard covers, and with all the classics of Disney, like uh, Cinderella and Snow White and a bunch of others that have not been adapted into movies. But um, yeah, w w we, we just love them one after the other. So we read a whole bunch. Uh, question number seven. Guess how much I love you by Sam McBratney and illustrated by Anita Jarem. Who had the biggest influence on you as a reader? Uh, well, to begin with, my parents, for the simple fact that they were reading themselves. Um, they were reading mainly newspapers and magazines. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a house of news junkies. Can I say that? <laughs> they love the news. They still love the news. Um, a little bit less today. But uh, yeah, I, I could see them read. So I think that's very important. But the other most important influence is clearly my brother, my big brother. Um, particularly when he was in high school and I was at the end of primary school. He's two years older than me. And at that time, I started to read everything he was reading, or almost everything. He was reading a biography of Wayne Gretzky. So when he, while he was at school, um, because during lunchtime, my brother remained in high school because the school was farther from home, but I came back home to eat my lunch. So during lunchtime, I was reading his biography of Wayne Gretzky. And uh, he read Asterix, so I read Asterix. And he read Agatha Christie, so I read Agatha Christie. And he read The Three Musketeers, so I read The Three Musketeers. So for a long time, I read pretty much whatever my brother read. So he's the one who introduced me to Alexandre Dumas. He's the one who introduced me to Agatha Christie. And uh, still today, he talks about books and I want to read. So not we, we don't have necessarily completely matching tastes in books, but sometimes he talks about books and I want to read them. And I read books and I'm thinking, oh yes, you're going to love that. And I recommend him books. So I would say my brother is the biggest influence on my reading life. Um, question number eight, The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Which book or set of books would give, would you give to an emerging reader? Or which book have you given as a gift more than once? I don't know much about emerging readers. I don't really have them in my life. I suppose I would try to give them something they would like. So I would try to adapt the gift to the uh, person receiving the gift. As for books that I have given... I am the sort of person who gives books at baby showers. So all of my friends who had children, I gave them a whole bunch of books. And some authors came more often than others. Sandra Boynton. I gave a whole bunch of books by Sandra Boynton, in particular, um, Hippos Go Berserk. So that's a book to help you count to 10. So it starts, one hippo all alone calls two hippos on the phone. And then two, three, four, five, six... Uh, all the way to nine, and then Hippo goes berserk, and then they leave the party. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, three, two, one, and one hippo alone once more misses the other 44. I love that book. <laughs> and then I also gave, uh, oh, the Lama Lama series uh, Lama Lama Red Pajama, uh, Lama Lama Mrs. Mama. Um, I don't remember the others, but I gave this one a couple of times. Um, oh, and uh, the, I forgot the name of the author. Uh, oh, uh, How to Catch a Star. Who wrote that? And he wrote another one, uh, Lost and Found, uh, which is about the little boy who found a little penguin. And, uh, oh, Shelley Swearingen did a whole video about that book. I'm going to leave a link to it in the description box. So this is another one that I gave more than once. So, uh, yeah, I, I give books to baby at baby showers. And they're appreciated, I think. I think. I hope. <laughs> And, and that's it, uh, the, 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 uh, the, I will stop stuttering. The creators of the tag do not ask us to tag people, but I suppose they would appreciate it if we did. Uh, the only problem is that uh, they tag pretty much everybody I know on booktube. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I'm looking at the list of the people they tagged and it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's the people I would usually tag myself. So I'm going to add to their list uh, two people they did not tag, though I do not necessarily associate them with picture books. That would be Greg from Another Bibliophile Read and Jim from Jim's Books Reading and Stuff. So they have not been tagged, and so I am tagging them. And uh, yeah, they, you, only if they want to do it, no obligation, and you don't have to answer with picture books, I, as I have just shown, because I did not answer with picture books except for the la very last question. So that is it for me. Thank you everyone for watching. I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine!